You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz with War. We've got petrodollar concerns, dollar concerns, interest rates, metals, all of that. Where is it heading? Let's talk with our good friend, Eric Haddock. He's had an uncanny record calling these markets over the past several years. And you find him at Inside Track Trading. That's inside with two eyes. Tracktrading.com. And Eric, well, hey, we're here in April, early April, April 6th. And what what do we make of these markets, particularly the dollar, the petrodollar? We've got the war going on. Uh, what do you see happening here? Well, Kerry, first of all, thanks for having me back on. Uh, and as far as the, uh, I'll, I'll start with the dollar. Uh, I, I kind of view that from a, a couple year standpoint. And there's been a very uncanny uh, approximate three year cycle in the dollar. I've detailed this for uh, probably 10, 10, 12 years now. And it's it's really helped time the major tops and bottoms, the intervals between them. Uh, most times it ranges from about a 38 to 41 month cycle. But it has also gone through the the progression that I look for from cycles where it uh, alternates first from successive highs, then ultimately breaks down, then alternates between successive lows. Um, in recent examples, those lows were in 2005, 2008, 2011, 2014. And usually in, in the textbook scenario of that progression, then after the fourth successive low, it will break through, invert, and start timing successive highs which it did in 2017 and 2020, had me looking for uh, the next major peak in 2023. And there's a lot of other cycles, a lot of other indicators that corroborate that. That's more kind of the backdrop. Uh, but at the same time, there are similar cycles between the lows and that those they pinpointed early 2021 as the time for a multi-year low. So it was a pretty straightforward um, basic outline that I was looking for, a, a bottom in early 2021 and a progressively higher move into 2023. And of course, you had fundamentals uh, starting to corroborate that early on with the idea that uh, at the time, interest rates were pretty much bottoming out. They really, in early 2021, there was only beginning to be talk of them them starting to head higher, but that's always a supportive factor for the dollar. And at the same time, you had what uh, what I know you and I have talked about for a couple of years now, uh, what I was looking for as far as these long-term war cycles that I was looking for to kick in in late 2021 and stretch all the way into 2025. And they certainly came right on schedule and also helped support the dollar. So from an overall perspective, you've got a lot of things underpinning it. But on an intermediate basis, I think it has pretty close to run its course and will probably be putting in a top right around current levels. Uh, from there, I'm looking for the dollar to uh, retrace maybe over a one to two month period and could get back to around 9550 in the dollar index. Hmm. Okay. So, so we're getting close probably uh, to a top here, huh? Yeah. On an intermediate basis, I, I think we are. Is it going to get to 100, uh, you think, uh, shortly over a hundred? I, it, it I think it's actually probably going to uh, stay just below that, uh, at least on the front month of the uh, dollar index futures that I'm watching. 
because the one kind of short-term indicator that I have my daily trend indicator was telling me the last week that uh, that the dollar needed to retest its early March peak, which was at 99.47, and we are just doing that now. The ideal scenario for a top would be that it doesn't even give a daily close above that level. So it might fall just short of of 100 uh, psychological levels like that often do uh, usher in turning points, sometimes with traders waiting for it to get above it and it surprises them and doesn't quite make it. Sometimes just the opposite, but uh, you're only talking um, small increments on an intermediate scale as to whether it uh, spikes a little bit above 100 or not. Uh, but right now, my expectation would be that it falls a little bit short. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So, so it, the dollar looked like it was down, you know, with all the talk coming out of the Middle East, the petrodollar, everything else, Russia. But it's certainly not out yet, is it? No, no. And it has really, uh, over the last 10, 15 years, it's in the upper end of its trading range. So... It has uh, maintained some resilience. And then a lot of times it's, especially when you're talking about the dollar index against a basket of currencies, it's not necessarily strength in the dollar, but relative weakness in one or more uh, competing currencies. I always talk about the uh, that old adage of the healthiest horse in the glue factory that, uh, <laughs> you know, fiat currencies are all having their their struggles, even as uh, metals, particularly gold, have had a five, six year steady uptrend. Uh, but that's been kind of disguised if you're just looking at the dollar index or other uh, paper currencies compared to other paper currencies. Right. Well, you know, uh, the, it's the uh, old Mark Twain saying uh, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated, huh? Yes. All right. Well, let's move on then. So interest rates, uh, we've seen them spiking uh, higher recently. Uh, mortgage rates, you know, over 5% again. Um, have they reached a, a peak uh, or got more to go? From both a technical and fundamental perspective, I think that we are stretching to an extreme on probably a two to three month basis. I have been talking about, first off, a a very consistent four year cycle in bonds and interest rates. And again, it went through that similar progression that I was just talking about where uh, the dollar was concerned from where the cycles alternate between lows and finally break out in an uptrend and then start alternating between highs. And from the perspective of bonds and and notes, uh, which are inverse to the actual interest rates, they had had this four-year cycle timing lows in the uh, 2004, 2008. Then uh, flipped over, started timing peaks in mid-2012, mid-2016. All of that was coming to a head along with other long-term cycles in mid-2020. And that's when I, I did some special reports about what I thought would be a major multi-year peak in bonds and notes and consequently major multi-year low in interest rates. And that four-year cycle, typically when you see a top like that, you'll see the market move for about two and a half, three years away from that, uh, which coincides with the outlook I've had for bonds and notes to head progressively lower into early 2023, interest rates heading gradually higher into that time frame. But as those as that trend broke down and I get more towards uh, six to 12 month cycles and trends and then three to six months, one to three months, uh, the, the ideal scenario was to see uh, the latest leg from July of last year into uh, late March of this year where bonds would sell off, interest rates would head up and then reach a, a bit of a crescendo for that trend 
So I think that bonds are very close to a bottom here and that they could rebound, uh, kind of consolidate and wait until July to hit a rebound peak, which I would expect to be a, a significantly lower peak than uh, your previous ones. But all that shows me that we've kind of, we're reaching an extreme and that we're likely to see a few months of consolidation. You know, maybe we will get some competing fundamentals now that everything has been bullish economic and, and higher inflation. Maybe you start to get a few competing things that um, all of a sudden Fed talk isn't quite as hawkish. Uh, and again, it doesn't mean that it's suddenly turning dovish, but just that it's not quite as extreme as it has been recently. And that is enough to turn a market. Mm hmm. All right. Well, it's interesting to see here because inflation, we should also talk about that because that's certainly on a cycle. And is it does it just continue on the way it is and the Fed does nothing or and the dollar continues to go up or what are we looking at here? Well, I think you are going to see the Fed continue to do uh, do something about it and try to attack it and keep it um now they can't keep it at bay anymore, but at least keep it from uh, getting out of control. But again, where the markets are concerned, you know, everything that's been uh, occurring over the last month and most of the Fed talk has been to such an extreme that, you know, if if they've been if inflation in their talk has been at a at a 95 on a zero to 100 scale, and all of a sudden their talk and the inflation fears are only at a 90 or an 85, you'll get the markets uh, turning and heading the other direction for a, a period of time, uh, even though that inflation is still very much there and, and the Fed uh, looking to steadily increase rates is still there. Uh, the markets anticipate things in advance and they've been an anticipating quite an extreme. So a little pullback in that, uh, in the intensity of that extreme will probably turn those markets. But my outlook has been for commodity inflation to wait until September, October of 2022 to put in its final um, extreme, final on a, on a one to two year basis, this trend that has been evolving since really the the bottom of March and April 2020. Uh, so I think that there could be um, a bit of a uh, pullback or consolidation here for perhaps a couple months, but then a final spike high leading into uh, late third quarter, early fourth quarter of 2022. Uh, and, and that's when I think we could see a peak in uh, in several of these inflationary gauges. And again, that doesn't mean that inflation suddenly dries up and, and dies away. It doesn't mean that uh, suddenly we go deflation. It, it just means that that's the extreme. That's where we hit a peak and then things uh, retreat a bit from there. Okay. Uh, so what effect uh, on the stock market here? We had a peak uh we pretty much it looks like it's uh, hitting resistance now and looks like we could well have uh, seen the highs, huh? Don't just survive. Thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Trilogy Metals is a world-class developer in Alaska's Ambler Mining District. The company already possesses 8 billion pounds of copper, 3 billion pounds of zinc, over 1 million gold equivalent ounces, and now over 77 million pounds of cobalt. Trilogy's Arctic project boasts an after-tax net present value of $1.4 billion with a 33% IRR. Trilogy is led by an experienced management team with proven success in discovering and developing projects in Alaska. The company is well capitalized, has no debt, and possesses strong institutional support. Trilogy trades on the New York and Toronto exchanges under the ticker symbol TMQ. To learn more, go to TrilogyMetals.com. That's TrilogyMetals.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Well, um, most of my intermediate work 
was looking for a a bottom in late February and then a a rebound on balance into the middle of April. Um, and now each one of these turning points has been has had a lot of divergence. So a lot of times it may just be one or two particular indexes or key stocks that set a final high, even as others are setting a lower high. But um, until we've broken some some key trend points, which we have not yet, uh, I still think that the Dow and and a couple other indexes have the potential to uh, to rally a little bit higher into uh, the particular week I'm looking at is April 18th to the 22nd. Uh, that's when a lot of my intermediate cycles are looking for a peak. So it wouldn't surprise me to see a another short term rally leading into that time frame. All right. And, and after that, uh... I, I think that these uh, equity markets have entered a, a prolonged period of, of volatile consolidation. And, and, and I've shown how it's comparative to some, some previous periods of time. Uh, 2018 is, is one of those periods. And it's funny because stocks have, for the last 12, 14 years, have adhered to a kind of an intriguing two-year cycle where the, the trends and the turning points are similar. It's not that every move is the same in magnitude, but you have relatively similar swings when it comes to timing. And um, one of the periods that I was looking for and comparing the recent action to was 2015-2016. But another one is 2018, where you look at how the markets saw an early year peak and then kind of stayed within a wide trading range for many months before setting a slightly higher peak in September, October of 2018, then seeing an even larger sell-off. A lot of my work and my cycles are saying that we could see something relatively similar to that uh, this year. So if we get a, the the intermediate peak that I'm talking about in uh, just after mid-April, I think that from there we could see a, a multi-week sell-off. But Depending on what one or two key indicators do in mid-April, uh, a weekly trend indicator that I watch closely, that will help me determine whether I think the subsequent sell-off would uh, reach reach the late February lows or just stay in a trading range and not not violate those lows, but instead just see a, several months of volatile back and forth trading. All right. So, so this is going to unfold over a long time period then. The yeah. And I, direction, I huh? uh, throughout the last couple of years, and I really uh, kind of compiled this all together at the end of last year, beginning of this year, uh, there's a lot of longer term cycles that have me anticipating a, a major peak, a whole topping process in 2022. And then I talked about some, uh, I, I use the term crash cycles, but often that's taken to more of an extreme than I'm trying to connotate with it. Um, but it, it's something where the market sees 20 to 40% sell-offs in, in a given period of time those cycles come back into play from late 22 to late 2023. So I think that we could, as I said, see this topping process here in 2022 uh, that is, is linked to uh, cycles as long as uh, 20 and 40 years in duration and, and then see a pretty uh, significant sell-off between the end of this year and the end of 2023. So I think we're getting into a more precarious uh, time frame. And you have seen some, there are some analogous periods in the past where 
you have things like the inflation and interest rates uh, heading higher, 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 and uh, the market, you know, reacts a little bit to it shakes it off each time, shakes it off second time, third time, fourth time. And then all of a sudden you get that straw that breaks the camel's back type of thing. And uh, one particular event, whether that be interest rates, inflation, all of a sudden is just too much for the market to handle. And and you get that big sell off uh, over a limited period of time. So that's the type of thing that I think is out on the horizon, but I don't think we're there yet. Okay. And let's uh, talk about oil. Um, you know, I've heard estimates that it could go $150, $250 a barrel. What are the uh, cycles telling you there? Well, I, I think that we have definitely seen a um, probably a multi-month peak in here there were some extreme levels that I was watching going leading into March up around 119 and crude spiked, I think, a couple bucks above that on an intraday basis. But the fact it held it on a daily and weekly basis uh, told me that 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 resistance, that upside target was was holding. And I from there, it looked like crude could uh, ultimately retrace back to 85 or so. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that you're going to see a, a volatile trading range there uh, between those levels uh, for, for quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so food, we've seen tremendous food inflation. We're talking shortages, everything else. And and uh, what uh, what are you seeing there? Again, from a market perspective, I think that particular one of the one of the grains that I was uh, talking about a lot from mid 2021 into early 2022 was wheat. And, and I didn't have my eyes on Russia, Ukraine at all. I just had uh, long term cycles and indicators that were all telling me to look for a parabolic move up in wheat. I gave three successive targets that I thought would be hit in 2022, first 950, then 11 and a quarter, then ultimately spiking above $13 a bushel, which is where it had peaked back in 2008. Um, and then you have the Russian invasion of Ukraine all of a sudden uh, wheat gets through all three of those targets in the matter of a couple of days and spikes above 13 right where that major resistance is and, and major upside target and reaches an extreme. Again, the markets anticipate things often so far out in the future to such an extreme that if you even got a, a little bit of... Um, minimizing of that or relaxation of that extreme, all of a sudden the markets react more vehemently because they've factored in such an extreme. And again, throughout the first quarter, there were weekly cycles that I kept publishing and saying, okay, wheat looks like it should head accelerate up into uh, the second week of March and there was a very consistent 14 to 15 week cycle that had timed each of the six previous highs. I was looking for a more extreme high in the first half of March. And that was right when wheat surged up above that $13 level and, um, and pretty much fulfilled everything from a timing and price perspective that I was looking for. Uh, so not to keep repeating the same thing, but I think that even in that market, we're in for some volatile consolidation because it reached an extreme. Um, it's it's not in a position to suddenly go back down to where it was uh, several months ago, but it also, barring some really extreme shocking news, isn't going to go any higher than where it went in the the coming two to three months. Okay. And uh, of course, precious metals. Looks like we hit a peak. 
almost uh, well for gold anyway, not for silver. And uh, and now we've kind of been in a sideways tight consolidation pattern. Yeah, gold had a lot of cycles peaking in uh, early March, but some related ones that peak um, in the second half of April. So one of the things I'm watching price action for very closely right now is to see if um, if there's a possibility that gold could set a higher high uh, in a few weeks. Uh, the jury's out on that one right now because there's there's several competing indicators that uh, that are showing it could rally, but perhaps peak a little bit lower than where it was in early March. Others that say it should retest that high. Uh, but from a timing perspective, that's what I'm looking for the next significant peak. Uh, really, uh, about the same week, it is the same week that I was just uh, citing in regard to stocks, uh, April 18th to the 22nd is is when this next cycle peak in gold comes into play. Uh, so there you know, could be something that uh, sees both those markets recovering a bit uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but looking out farther, what my work uh, had been and continues to show was there were three key time frames. One was late September, early October of 2021, when I thought we'd see a major bottom in gold and silver. The second one was late February, early March, when I thought we would see the culmination of an initial three to six month surge. And the third one is August, September of this year, 2022. Um, the weekly cycles are starting to hone that a little bit. But as we get a little closer, that should pare down to a, a two or three week time window uh, when I think we will see another high. Uh, and that could be a much more significant one for precious metals. And that even kind of dovetails a bit with what I was talking about with commodity price inflation looking out towards September, October. So uh, you could certainly have metals and commodities uh, going together during that phase uh, as they have in the recent upswings. So I do think that there's another peak out on the horizon, uh, but gold and silver are notorious for what I call the, the 90, 10 rule of cycles that, Often 90% of the price move occurs in the last 10% of the cycle. So you could see them trading sideways for quite some time. And then you get, a, it might just be a couple of weeks out in uh, August, September, maybe late July leading into August, September, where all of a sudden you get the primary surge happening just over that two to four week period. Uh, so you're going to be looking at a lot of that. Uh, the, all of those broader cycles that I discuss, as I said, are just a backdrop. I have very specific technical indicators, um, price, risk, and money management uh, factors that, that are all weighed in the equation uh, before going to more specific analysis and expectations and trading strategies. All right. Well, interesting. Hey, finally, one thing we should talk about is uh, cryptos, particularly Bitcoin uh, cycles there. Well, I I am looking at uh, actually that September period is when I have said that I thought uh, cryptos could see a, a final low there. Uh, and that could just be a retest of uh, of the lows of earlier this year. I'm not sure exactly the, the price targets for that until the intervening uh, rally that we've seen has has uh, run its course uh, since the early 2022 lows. My outlook had been that uh, that. Bitcoin would see an initial rally up to about 45, 46,000, uh, and then ultimately make it up to around 52,000 before it sees another leg down. And so that's where my work is at right now. It's been in a 
two to three month recovery slash uptrend and uh, that it still is has a decent potential to get as high as about 52,000 uh, before we see a secondary peak there. Okay. All right. So 52,000 and then uh, how low can it go after it hits that? Well, ever since the uh, the, the peak up around 70,000, my focus has been on major support down around 29 to 30,000. Uh, obviously, we got down close to that in January, spiking down to an intraday low around 33. Uh, a couple of my key indicators will either either confirm to me that Bitcoin could still spike below that or that that a subsequent low in September might just retest or hold above that. But twenty nine to thirty thousand has been the really the most noteworthy and significant support uh, on on a one to two year basis that my work is showing. Right. I, so when you're analyzing Bitcoin, we don't have you know, we've got 12 years, 13 years worth of history, but there's no fundamentals to it. It's purely cycles. Uh, does that make it easier to analyze Bitcoin or does it uh, does it mean you have to use other tools? It's typically it, it's other tools kind of factored in there because really all of technical and, and cycle analysis is is based on on mass psychology and and synergy of, of many factors. And when you have a very limited database to draw from. Uh, there's, you know, for many years, even even currently, although it's coming less and less, there's the potential for uh, I don't even want to necessarily use the word manipulation, but um, events to really push a market back and forth to extremes. Uh, you know, if if one day Elon Musk, tust, t- excuse me, tweeting about uh, accepting and not accepting Bitcoin <laughs> can suddenly, you know, swing it dramatically yeah, for, for a week or more. And that's telling you it's a market that still has a, a lot of illiquidity, uh, even though it is, uh, you know, becoming a very uh, large market from a technical and price standpoint. There still is a lot of um, unnecessary volatility that it's it's still working through. So answer to your question, I I take a lot of those cycles and technical indicators with a grain of salt. Uh, I, you know, I want them to uh, prove and confirm themselves more quickly than I might with with other uh, markets and other indicators. Uh, but well, with that said, it it has kind of surprised me over the last three years or so how much Bitcoin has adhered to intermediate cycles. Um, so, you know, telling me it certainly is a developing market and and maybe because of that, um, that lack of too much white noise that that it's been a little bit cleaner in some respects as far as technical and cycle analysis. So it's it's kind of a catch twenty two there or a competing factors, uh, some that certainly give you pause if you're just relying on technical analysis, uh, but others that have shown themselves to be. Um, more accurate than than I would have expected in a in a very young market like this. Yeah, and and I guess that's the next question. Do you see a long term future for Bitcoin and uh, other cryptos? Uh, for cryptos as a whole, yes. Uh, for Bitcoin, I don't know, and part of that is just that you know throughout history, it's kind of those those leaders and those pioneers are often not around when you finally get to full acceptance of uh, whatever uh, overall market or entity that you're talking about. And so just from a a general principle standpoint, and when you hear some of the critiques of of Bitcoin now, 
compared to other cryptos. Um, you know, it's one of those things that uh, it may uh, go its its way over the coming years as others come up, uh, offer sure. offer other efficiency and uh, and as as uh, uh, as governments and other. Uh, large entities start to compete with it as well. Uh, you're going to get things that probably supplant Bitcoin as as the leader. All right. Well, as they say, the future is always uncertain. We're just going to have to wait and see what happens there. Uh, again, I suggest you go over to InsideTrackTrading.com. That's I N S I I D E TrackTrading.com. And if you got a question for Eric, you can shoot us an email. We'll get you an answer. KL at KerryLutz.com. And don't forget, make sure you get your free newsletter at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Eric, always a pleasure. Always informative, instructive. Really appreciate you coming on. We will talk to you again real soon. Thanks for having me back, Kerry. Thanks for listening to Kerry Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.